Hello, everyone. We'll be starting very soon. Waiting for people to file in for the meeting. I'm Ed Pank Jr. And we should start within a minute. Uh, feel free to post any questions that you'd like uh, me to answer, and I can see if I can address them um, at the end of the talk or at any time. If you ever have anything you'd like to ask, feel free to, to post it, and I'll be glad to try to address it. And let's go. Uh, welcome to Mathematical Games, Episode 15, Pi and Other Topics. I am Ed Peck Jr., and uh, I am the head of the Wolfram Demonstrations Project and various other areas of Wolfram research. And my main interest is recreational mathematics. One of the leaders in that was Martin Gardner, who wrote a series of columns for mathematical games called uh, for uh, a series of columns for Scientific American called Mathematical Games. And I've been trying to make a, a series of talks sort of in the spirit of Martin Gardner's columns. Uh, one of my uh, favorite types of columns by Martin Gardner was when he did a hodgepodge of topics, usually seven or nine different topics. And those would usually cover a wide variety of previously unsolved questions in mathematics. And I always found those very interesting. And almost always, his readers would manage to solve the problem within a few issues. Of course, there's a, there's a few exceptions, but I always found it interesting to see mathematics being solved as I was reading issue by issue of his columns. And uh, of course, many famous mathematicians like uh, 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 Richard Guy, John Conway, Ellen Burlicamp, uh, and uh, many others uh, helped him to, to solve these problems. Here's a few of the demonstrations involving unsolved problems, and I'll be hitting on some of these today. So I, I started out by saying the, the first topic would be pi in celebration of Pi Day. We did a few... Uh, post on Pi Day at uh, community.wolfram.com. And one thing to notice is that the area of a circle is pi r squared. So if you take the first five numbers and square them and then convert those into characters, you get 1, 4, 9, 16, and 25, which makes these letters A, D, I, P, and Y, which is an anagram of Pi Day. So if you square numbers, you get pi day. And I thought that was interesting. There's various weird ways of getting pi. And one of them is to start with the Minger sponge, which is this object here. And you can take slices of it, as shown in a few demonstrations. If you cut it in half on a diagonal, you get this odd object. Uh, but uh, under that, in two dimensions, there's a fractal known as the Sierpinski carpet. And that's sort of the face of a Minger sponge. And here's uh, two different ways you can code up getting that fractal. Um, we could also perhaps look at one dimension, a Cantor set where we start with a line segment, we remove the middle third, then we remove the middle thirds of what's left and the middle thirds of those and so on. And eventually you get what's called Cantor dust, which is a uh, set of area zero. Uh, it's basically all the ternary numbers that, but they don't form a connected set of numbers. So, there's a one, two dimensional, three dimensional ways of getting this, this concept of taking one third. But we don't need to take just one third. We can do other fractions. 
uh, with the Wallace Steve, if you take eight ninths times 24 25ths times 48 40 ninths and so on, you get pi over four eventually. So if you do the same sort of um, Sierpinski carpet, uh, but with uh, increasingly smaller squares instead, you get this object which approaches the area of a circle. And that's known as the Wallace-Sieve pi approximation. And it's sort of shown in this uh, formula here. We can also do this in three dimensions with this more complicated formula here where we're taking um, one third, then one fifth, then one seventh, then one ninth, and so on. If you take the odd values as squares, you get this weird object, which happens to have the same volume as a sphere. And that's a way of making a Minger sponge have the same volume as a sphere. You just take smaller sections each time and you get the area of a sphere. There's other strange ways of getting pi. We can use the canonical tetragonal anti-wedge hexahedron, which is this object here. Uh, here, it's, here it's shown with its uh, dual. And uh, by canonical, basically that means the, the object is, is uh, aligned so that for a unit sphere, the edges are all perpendicular to the sphere or tangent to the sphere. And uh, it's like it's like this. The uh, the sphere is tangent to each of the edges of the of the uh, polyhedron. And it's possible to do this with every polyhedron. Every polyhedron has a canonical form. And it just so happens that for this object with uh, six faces, its volume is very close to pi, to uh, four decimal places. And as I said, you can do that with any polyhedron. Here's the demonstration canonical polyhedra, where you can basically take any polyhedron up to 10 faces, and it will automatically make the canonical form for that for that polyhedron. So here's the 97th of the 257 octahedra. Let's see if we can get a different one here. I'm not sure these are actually changing. Eh, it's probably freezing up in some way. So it uh, it works online. So uh, if you want, it's called the canonical polyhedra demonstration on demonstrations.welcome.com. We can do more on pi. For example, 7 to the 7th divided by 4 to the 9 is very close to pi. Uh, within five decimal places. We can look at other constants, such as the golden ratio, which, which satisfies this um, uh, relationship. Uh, uh, phi, to the, phi squared equals phi plus one. And here's the golden ratio here. It turns out that if you have three coins tangent to each other, you've got a unit disk and three golden ratio disk, they'll make a perfect tangency to a wall as shown here. So this is one odd way of getting the golden ratio using circles. If you move that up, what you need is the Tribonacci constant, which is seen in the snub cube and the snub dodecahedron. Uh, here, here are the those two objects it turns out that all the complicated vertices seen in these two 
if you look at them in terms of the Fibonacci constant um, for, for the snub cube or the Fibonacci constant in, connect, in, in addition to the golden ratio for the snub dodecahedron, that all of the complicated vertices simplify to integers if you look at them at in the root space of the Fibonacci constant and the Fibonacci constant plus the golden ratio. Everything is is uh, is um, integers in those two spaces. And if you use the Fibonacci constant, as shown here, this is the Fibonacci constant here. Um, T to the third equals uh, T squared plus T plus one. If you use it in this way, you get five tangencies. You have the unit circle at the center here and five coins based on the this expression of the Fibonacci constant, and you get this perfect tangency of five disks. In constrained geometry such as this one, there's a few constants that come up a lot. There's this one, the plastic constant here, this one, the super golden ratio, this one, the Fibonacci constant, which we just use, this one based on seven, and this one based on nine. Plastic constant, super golden ratio, Fibonacci constant. The last two are, we can look at the discriminants. The one based on seven has a, has a number field discriminant of seven squared. The one based on nine has a number field discriminant of nine squared. It turns out that this value related to seven is related to heptagons. If you're in the, if you, if you're uh, dealing with something and you look at the discriminant of a polynomial in the space you're working with, and it turns out to be 49, you're in the space of heptagons. And similar to that, if you check on something, you've got this weird value and the polynomial is as a discriminant of 81, that means you're in the space of nonagons. And I found this happens more often than, than I would ever expect. Uh, for example, you can, you can try that just using circle points. If you do circle point seven, which makes, makes a heptagon, you get a whole bunch of strange polynomials. But if you look at the discriminants for all those polynomials, they almost all have discriminant of 49. And similarly for the nonagon, they all almost have they almost all have discriminants of 81. So that's sort of my secret for figuring out strange geometries is I look at their number field discriminant. If you look at the actual polynomials themselves, for example, here's for circle point seven, the polynomials tend to look somewhat nasty. You get you get all these strange terms. But when you just look at the discriminants, everything simplifies nicely and you can figure out what's going on. Uh, and these five discriminants happen to come up a lot with constrained geometry. But there's other, um, other weird geometries you can go into. For example, here's a trick we can do with e pi and the square root of 19. We do this, we add 24, and we take the 24th root, and we get this value. And then we look at x to the third equals x, or 2 times x plus 1, and that solves to be the same value, seemingly. Now, I, I, I deliberately picked 11 decimals of accuracy. If we use more decimals of accuracy, you'll see that they diverge. But uh, that's a very close fit. This particular polynomial has a discriminant of minus 76, which is another frequent one that's seen. And with that particular geometry space, we can get this covering of a disk with 12 identical disks. And this is the best possible solution found by uh, Mellison.
Here's a similar trick with e pi and the square root of 163, which I'm sure many of you have seen. If you add 24 and take the 24th root, you get this value. And if you take a look at x to the third equals 2 times 3x squared minus 2x plus 1, you get the same value to 33 places. This is um, in the field of modular forms. This particular polynomial is highly related to this particular value in J space. And for an explanation, you can see my column shattering the plane. Another related item is circles of Descartes, which, which has many of the examples of these tangent circles doing weird things with the bend of the radius. As something I mentioned last week that the bigger my neighbor problem had been solved, where you have a deck of cards and you're basically playing war with each other. And each time an ace, king, queen, or jack comes out, there's a penalty of four, three, two, or one cards. And the question has been for about 100 years whether this game ever runs into a cycle or does it always end. And just last month, it had been, it's been shown by Braden Casella that the game can go on forever with this particular starting arrangement. So that problem has now been solved. Here's a item known as heesh tilings. If you take this shape at the center, you can surround it with a corona of copies of itself in darker gray. You can surround it again with the light gray snakes, and you can surround it a third time with, with another set of dark gray space. But at that point, you can't surround it anymore. This, uh, this basically has a heesh number of three. And it turns out there's a there's an infinite set of these. Let's see if I can make this work. And for some reason, this doesn't want to work at the moment. Why don't you want to work? Let's see here. Oh, that's embarrassing. I probably have too many things in this notebook. Uh, however, if you go to the demonstration, you can see that it works. And each time you surround a, a, a copy of itself, you can get the, you can see that the snakes continue to work. Let me see if I can get this to work if I exit out of here. Quit the current all. And then reevaluate this. Hopefully this will work quickly. If anybody has any questions, it would be a good time to ask them. All right. That's come back. Now let's see if I can make this work. All right. Sorry about that. So here's the, the smallest snake. Here's the next level, next level, next level. It turns out that all of these snakes, there's an, there's an infinite number of them. You can just keep growing them. All of them have heesh level three, and that they can be surrounded with three coronas, but no more. And this is an object I found while looking at uh, Craig Kaplan's paper, Heesh Numbers of Unmarked Polyforms. I looked through all his data, and I happened to notice he had an infinite series in the Heesh threes. And so he said, well, these are now called the peg snakes. And this and other results about Heesh numbers 
are at this link here, polynomial.org.uk. And uh, I'll be posting this uh, a bit later, but uh, here's the site, and it's got data on thousands of uh, polyhedra. And it was through this that the hat was found. Uh, David Smith found this particular shape, and he couldn't figure out what was going on with it, so he contacted K Craig Kaplan to figure out the Heesh number. But it turned out you could make as many coronas as you wanted, but they weren't periodic in any way. And as such, a, a little bit over a year ago, the hat was finally uh, published to the world. And we have various functions relating to the hat. For example, hat hexagonal tiling, you can you can make as many layers of the hat tiling as you might like. Here's uh, one of the strange patterns caused by the related object, uh, the turtle. You get these weird spiral patterns. And uh, we have, uh, if you look at our community site, we've got a lot of different material written about the hat. And I gave a talk about it uh, almost a year ago, introducing some of the things that had been found. Uh, here's David Smith and Robert Fauthauer, who runs tessellations.com, holding a sphere covered with the hat and pentagons. Uh, Dune is in the nude, uh, is in the news, and the symbols used in the poster happen to be superset, union, intersection, and subset. And one odd quirk about that, if you turn everything clockwise, the direction of the opening spells out news, which I thought was interesting. A rectangle based on A4 paper has the property that it can be divided into similar rectangles. And it happens that these make a perfect series of the squares and double squares. And this has recently been uh, made as a puzzle by uh, Rex Perez. Uh, Patrick Hamlin wanted to see what the best approximation you could get to a square using A4 rectangles. And here's his best two results. It turns out that it's impossible to divide a square into A4 rectangles, but you can get very, very close. These two approximations are within uh, three decimal places and five decimal places. You can also divide a square into acute, uh, acute similar triangles. There's only one acute triangle that works, and that is the 45, 60, 75 triangle. Uh, that was proven by Lakovich in 1990. There's two other triangles that work that are obtuse, and you can also do it in many ways with right triangles. But if you use non-right triangles, there's only three triangles that can divide a square. And it was long and unsolved question, what is the fewest number of triangles that the square could be cut into? And uh, Tom Sergatis got it down to 32 triangles, as, 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 uh, as shown here. And here are the vertices used. They're all based on the square root of 3. The, uh, the A4 paper is based on square root of 2. So this is kind of a tour of different geometries that do weird things. I introduced a few earlier, plastic constant, super golden ratio, Fibonacci constant, and square root of 2 and square root of 3, and the golden ratio. Those are the big main ones in weird geometry. So switching over a bit, smooth numbers. Here's a 19 factorial, and it happens that the largest prime factor is 19. So... 
here's uh, two numbers, 123,200 uh, factors into these factors, all 11 or less. If you add one, it's equal to three to the six times 13 squared. So this is, um, everything is has uh, factors of 13 or less. And as such, this is called a 13 smooth number, and this is an 11 smooth number. These are the two largest neighboring numbers that are both 13 smooth. So we can make a quick, uh, we can make uh, shorter versions than this for factorization. Here's one sample with format factorization, but uh, I wrote this bit of code to make it even even uh, more compact. So this number is equal to two to the six, five squared, seven times 11. And this is uh, three to the six times 13 squared. So here's a factorization table for the numbers up to 144. I came into smooth numbers in a weird way. This number caused an error in some code. The fourth root of 91 over 10. But uh, you could also represent that as 9.1. So when I was trying to figure out what was going on, I looked at the continued fraction and I noticed it was sort of weird. You got these high values, which usually doesn't happen in a simple continued fraction. Usually that indicates something is happening. And uh, this value happened to be very close to this value within seven decimal places. Uh, 33 19 to the fourth is equal to 9.1, unless you go to more decimal places. So it seems that 91 over 10 is equal to almost 33 to the fourth over 19 to the fourth. Or if you multiply with cross diagonals, 91 times 19 to the fourth is almost equal to 10 over 33 to the fourth. When you multiply those out, you get these two numbers, which are both 19 smooth. Two times three to the fourth times five times 11 to the fourth, and seven times 13 times 19 to the fourth are 11 million blah, 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 and that same number plus one. And it turns out these are the two highest values for two consecutive 19 smooth numbers. And it's a famous example in the ABC conjecture and other branches of number theory. This is sort of a well-known weird exception for some strange things in number theory. But it turns out that it sort of falls out from the square root of 9.1. And playing around with that more, I wondered, well, what are some other 19 smooth numbers that can be found? And it turns out that this number here, which is all sevens and nines, is a 19 smooth number. 17 times 19 then to the sixth is this weird number. So in an overnight run, I decided to take a look at what are the smoothest numbers made out of two digits? And it turns out that these numbers, now in the online encyclopedia of integer sequences, are the smoothest values. And here's their representations and factorizations. Let's see here. I wonder if this is going to work now. Here's the largest square numbers you can make with particular sets of digits. For example, with the, with the numbers um, 6, 0, and 9, the squares of these numbers are all represented with just those three digits. And uh, so far, this is an unsolved question. There's um, two triples that are unsolved, uh, 013 and 678. 
all other numbers have strange square numbers uh, built from those div digits. And uh, I, I might note that that uh, these are only for sporadic solutions. We we leave out the trivial solutions. For example, uh, there's numbers of this form which we don't list. But uh, here are cases with zero, one, and two, which are stranger. So this is the uh, squares containing three different digits. And this is a, an unsolved uh, question. Uh, what are the extents to these and whether there's any more than are in this table? Uh, these are all the known values as of uh, last year. The De Bruyne torus is another item I took a look at recently. If you take a look in uh, one dimension, this sequence here has all items of order two from the alphabet 0, 1, 2, and 3. For example, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, and 0, 0 are all in there. Also, 1, 1, 1, 2 is 1, 2, and 1, 3. Uh, and it's cyclic. Uh, 3, 0 is the last item. In this sequence here, all order 4 items from 1 and 0 are cyclically represented. So here's 0, 0, 0, 1, or 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, and so on. It turns out that the 16 different ways of grabbing numbers from here are all represented within this. It's also possible to do that in order 2. Um, for example, every single square that's possible with these three colors is within this sequence. And I'm just basically moving the pattern around. Notice that this uh, um, shape here is in all of these. I'm just basically moving around so that a particular chosen sequence is at the top. In a quaternary, I'm doing the same thing. Uh, any, any possible two by two square of these four colors uh, can be moved to the top here in this De Bruyne torus. In binary, any three by three item is within this, uh, our, our story. Uh, any three by two rectangle is within here and it is basically moving this shape around. And in this larger rectangle, any three by three square is represented in there somewhere. So if you want to generate all possible patterns in a small place, you'll want to use a De Bruyne torus. Here's a problem I looked at uh, about seven years ago, you want to divide a triangle so that no two edges are shared. So for example, here we're dividing this triangle up and these four triangles, none of the two internal triangles shares a full edge. And same with this here. And so on, all of these have that property. And one thing we want to avoid is taking a solution and then using that, uh, sticking it into one of the smaller triangles. So it, it it wouldn't be all that interesting to take this solution and divide up, say, this triangle here, uh, because that's sort of an obvious extension. Once you have these, these, uh, these found, is there a way to, to find more of them? And that's a problem I, I posed. Uh, one solution I came up was to look at Flagel diagrams for planar graphs and picking vertex sets, which might be used to, to go backwards to these triangle solutions. For example, uh, this one here can be used to find this solution here. However, there's a whole bunch of planar graphs that pop out, uh, bi billions, trillions, and so on, 
And I was unsuccessful in gleaning those out, but I did manage to doodle and find other solutions, such as this one, where all the triangles are the same area except the central triangle. Uh, just recently, last month, uh, a person on on uh, one of the mass sites called Ravenclaw Prefect managed to find a whole bunch of weird solutions. Uh, for example, this here, this here, and here's some other odd solutions he found. And I finally asked him, well, how did you find these? And his, his uh, answer was, I just basically doodled them and I, I started finding them. So here's a, a very hard problem in constrained geometry where the best solution solving method seems to be doodling by hand. And uh, I don't know of anything other, other than this that sort of compares with that. So uh, it's, uh, it's uh, unclear to me how, how this can be extended more, but uh, he's managed to find this, this set of infinite solutions. Uh, for example, these are in a series, and they're non-trivial extensions of each other. And he also has this one at the bottom, which is also a very strange uh, setup. But uh, he's basically shown that there's an infinite number of these uh, weird uh, triangles with no shared edges. And I mentioned Schlegel diagram. So here's a Wolfram demonstration, which has all the gra planar graphs up to uh, 10 vertices and will make the Schlegel diagram. I'm not sure whether this will actually work. Yes, it does. Good. Uh, when I originally made this, the, um, the tut representation for a planar graph hadn't been finalized. I should redo this one so that it uses the tut diagrams of a planar graph, which, which basically gives the Schlegel diagram automatically. Is my code for these isn't all that great. The the code for tut diagrams of a graph, and if you just do um, um, graph, what is it called? The uh, graph layout tut diagram uh, automatically does this for you. Uh, last year it was shown that life is omniperiodic. Here's the last solution that was found and we can uh, run this uh, this is a demonstration that has all of the life oscillators in the Donway's game of life uh, up to period 100 so there's a uh, period 19 uh, let's see period 41 was one of the last ones found Oops, there's period I've gone too far. So here's uh, period 43. Period 42. And period 41. It was uh, an unsolved problem until last year, whether there was a oscillator for every possible period in the game of life, but that has now been solved. And I believe that I, my solutions listed here are the smallest known solutions for each one. On the game of life, uh, recently released was a free book. Uh, here's a, a picture of it. But if you go to Conway Life slash book, you can get this, you can get a download of this book for free. And this basically covers the game of life in great detail. Uh, many of these things were not uh, solved until just recently. And this book does a really good summary of, of everything about the game of life as it is known as of last year. A question that was recently looked at, is it possible to make a polycube so that 
no three cubes are in a row in any direction. And uh, Georg Arndt uh, took a look at this, and he was able to grow the solution right up to this object here with 26 cubes. This is the largest possible connected polycube so that no two cubes are in a line in any direction, uh, not just diagonally or orthogonally, but uh, weird knight's moves or anything else like in, or anything else. In any direction, there's no three cube centers in a straight line. And that's as large as you can go. Uh, then he decided to take a look at uh, similar problems. Uh, can we avoid no four in a row in either direction? Uh, with with uh, simple polyforms, here's the record with 15 squares. And it turns out that uh, Rodolfo Kirchan found this uh, earlier. He also looked at no four in a line with the restriction that no cube was at the midpoint of two others uh, so that you couldn't have three cubes right next to each other. With, uh, with that restriction, the growth was reasonable enough you could solve the problem, and that ended with this 75 cube object. Uh, no, no four cubes are in a straight line in any direction. And also there's no uh, three cubes so that one of the cubes is at the midpoint of the other two. Uh, the solution for uh, if you can have a midpoint cube is unsolved because it has sort of explosive growth at the start and it's unclear how to resolve that before it starts uh, decreasing in size. Let's see, uh, it's 2024. There's various things we can say about 2024. It's the sum of uh, the first nine cubes, except for one. Uh, next year, we'll be able to add one at the start. It's also the Chevyshev number, and it's uh, 765 squared times seven plus one, the square root. It's also a dodecahedral number and a tetrahedral number as shown here, it turns out that all the decahedral, though decahedral numbers are also tetrahedral numbers in a strange way. Uh, in a earlier talk, I talked about the Goldberg uh, tile and I decided to write it up more. Uh, it's in OEIS and it was developed by by M. Goldberg in 1955. And here's what it looks like. It's basically an equilateral triangle with half of a 45, 45, 90. Eight, uh, 48 uh, tile solution for the dodecagon. And for some reason, I see there's a spinny wheel over here. So um, let's see. So here's a way of dividing a dodecagon into 48 identical tiles with the Goldberg tile. Uh, Andrew Hudson recently found some new tilings, as shown here. And I haven't yet added these to my catalog of substitution tilings. And this is sort of a note to myself to do that. So here's one of the two that he found, which is based on a Passat uh, number that hadn't been used before in a substitution tiling. And here's a new substitution tiling based on the square root of three. Uh, sort of note to myself, add these to the big catalog. Uh, here's a solution for dividing a triangle into 
five similar triangles. And a person asked whether this was a known object. Well, it was known, but it wasn't published by anyone so far as I know. So I decided to write it up more. It's based on the super golden ratio. Uh, uh, psi, yes, that's, the, that's psi. Psi to the third equals psi squared plus one. And that's the super golden ratio as shown here. Whenever I'm doing with these constraints, I look at the discriminant, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, this one has discriminant minus 31. Here are some points for this dissection here. And if you look at the square root space in the super golden ratio, everything, everything is basically fractions of 12 in that geometric space and uh, with that we can we can uh, make a diagram of the solution as shown here these values here are powers of the super golden ratio for example this uh, zero here means this value is the super golden ratio to the power of zero or one this value here is the super golden ratio uh, one and Two means it's the super golden ratio squared. And it turns out that a, a, a zero, one, two triangle, if you use powers of the super golden ratio, so one super golden ratio, super golden ratio squared, you get a triangle that has a 120 degree angle here. And with five of these, uh, this triangle and that triangle are similar. Are, are identical. This triangle and this triangle are identical, and this one is is scaled down one level. With these five triangles, you can get an equilateral triangle. And I believe that this will now be named after uh, Gosen or uh, Carlsenberg, because he was the first to actually publish it. Even though quite a few people, including myself, knew about it, we just hadn't published it yet. I mentioned uh, last time that the chance that five points will make an ellipse is still an unsolved question. So uh, I figured I would mention that again since I'm doing a hodgepodge. Uh, what are the chances of five points making an ellipse? And you can get you can see more details about that in my previous talk. Um, I just showed the super golden ratio 0, 1, 2 dissection. And that's that's uh, using a power triangle. We can do the same sort of thing with the Kepler triangle, which is a power, which is a power triangle based on the square root of the golden ratio. So if you take what I just said, the, the zeroth power, the first power, and the second power, you you get a right triangle. So this is one, the square root of the golden ratio and the golden ratio itself makes a it makes a right triangle. And exactly five years ago today, it turns out, I I uh, managed to find this tiling here as a subset of solutions in my demonstration wheels of powered triangles. And that led to the column I mentioned, shattering the plane, which has a lot of new substitution tilings. But uh, I wanted to look at other power triangles recently, and I found some interesting dissections of rectangles of triangles and series. With the uh, super golden uh, ratio, I found this series where I use 0, 2, 3 triangles. And if you multiply it by that value again, you're just basically adding one to each of the, the powers. So 0, 2, 3 is equal to 1, 3, 4, and uh, so on. All of these triangles are similar. They are in series. Each one has an area this much larger than the previous one. And all seven of them assemble together to make a nice 
rectangle with sides and ratio of the super golden ratio. You can also do that with the plastic constant. Here are seven triangles in series that make a dissection based on the plastic constant. You can also do that with the golden ratio. Here's six triangles in series, which combine together to make a rectangle. If you just use three pieces, you get what's called Brugner's three-piece tangram, and that's shown here. And there's another series called the chi ratio, which I used in my in my chi tiling. You can get these triangles in series as shown here. I haven't figured out how to make a rectangle with this one yet. A uh, weird property. I mentioned heptagons had weird properties. Here's one of them. Take a heptagon and then make these lines. And I show some of these lines here. It turns out that the intersections of those lines define all but one of the points of another heptagon, which has twice the area of the original heptagon. I show that uh, here. And all the code for this is either on community.wolfram.com uh, right now or soon will be. Uh, this is uh, one of the things I wrote up a few years ago, uh, but I plan to combine all these into one big mega post uh, sometime soon. And it turns out that if you take three, if you take three points so that it's it's not, so it's, it's, it's a scaling uh, triangle, uh, this point, this point, and that point, if you reflect on each edge, you get you get three new triangles. So this triangle reflected over here makes this triangle. Uh, this triangle reflected on this edge makes this triangle. And this triangle reflected on this edge makes this triangle. That's uh, three extra triangles. And if you look at these points, you get a new triangle, which is similar to the original uh, one, two, four heptagon triangle with double the area. And that's a weird property that only one other triangle has. It's, it's strange that the heptagon has this strange property. Uh, another weird heptagon geometry item led to this graph here. And it turns out that this is all done with unit edges. All these, all these uh, edges have length one. You've got a heptagon on the outside. And one layer in, you've got a uh, heptagonal star. And then on the, on the inside, you've got the order two heptagonal star. But it turns out they, that you can twist them so that everything has unit distances away from each other. And this object happens to be rigid. It, uh, it sets a record for bracing a heptagon. And it turns out to be so rigid that you can take one of these edges, remove the two connecting vertices, and everything attached to those two vertices. And the object is still rigid after you've ripped all that away. It's a super rigid object. And it, it sets various strange records in bracing geometry. Uh, since I, I talked about measures, uh, I, I've got this graph here. You, you've got a measure called the Gutenberg. You can take five of them and make a twip, a twips. You can take another five of them and make a cosmological quantum point length. You can take four of those and make a a Johnson point, and eight of those makes a button. Three of those makes a barley corn, and three of those equals an inch. Three inches make a palm, and so on. I made this uh, ridiculous graph of strange measures where everything has unit multiples of previous items. For example, there are four 
inches in a hand, but there's two inches in a stick. There's three hands in a foot, and so on. Uh, this is a a weird thing on measuring. I, I saw a a uh, uh, much smaller version, and I I figured with all the things we have in measure data for Mathematica, I could make something much larger. Uh, there's recently a finding with the Nauru graph, which is shown here. Uh, you can get that by rolling an octahedron and getting all 24 orientations for this rolling octahedron. Um, if you basically roll it on one edge, you get this connected object. But if you keep rolling, you basically go straight up on this uh, order three torus and you get back to this orientation. And everything is connected in this way to get the equivalent of the Nauru graph. But somebody else noticed that all the half twists of an order two Rubik's cube also make a Nauru graph. That was something that was just found uh, last year, and I thought that was interesting. We've got various things with uh, polyforms here, uh, and I'll just go through. These are this is something I found. Here's uh, some items that Patrick Hamlin found. It's possible to divide a a equilateral triangle into five imens, as shown here. This is the smallest possible solution. And here's a another polyform where eight different uh, sizes will make a equilateral triangle. And this is an object I found five years ago today. You can make an infinite series of this particular fractal triangle to make a copy of itself. And it turns out that with some rather simple code for the complicated object, you get this object I call the fractal cal nautilus. All these fractal triangles here are similar to each other. And I use that as a plot point in a novel I just uh, uh, released on Amazon uh, uh, last week called Non Secretary of the Equator. And in it, I've got a whole history of science fiction novels. Uh, for example, this one from 1888, uh, there's a quote in that novel, are credit cards issued to the women just as to the men? And Dr. Leitz replies, certainly. That's from 1888. It's the invention of credit cards, but it wasn't until 1974 that this was realized where women could get credit cards freely in the United States. So I thought this was an interesting bit of science fiction I found lots of uh, science fiction tidbits while researching this novel, and so I've, I've packed all of those and, and many other math facts and science facts into this hard science fiction novel, Non-Secretary of the Equitar. And that's what I had prepared. Uh, many thanks for listening. Let me see if I can address some of these questions here. Um, the uh, Got some qu questions on the ellipse. Uh, yeah, the Conway Life book really is a beautiful uh, book. I highly recommend it. And I don't see any questions here I can answer quickly. So I'll, I'll just thank everyone for attending my talk. Uh, many thanks to everyone. And I'll be back next uh, month with another talk. So many thanks.